Hello and welcome dolls to another episode. Today I'd like to take you on a journey back to one of the most magical styles of the late 1960s and 70s, the medieval revival. Picture the vibrant music scene, the eclectic style, all blending together to create a unique tapestry of medieval-inspired style. Something about the Middle Age times and the medieval style deeply fascinates people. That's why there's a medieval revival every couple of decades. However, the late 60s and early 70s medieval revival might be one of the most memorable ones because of its lasting impact on fashion, music, film, and art. To understand how this came to be, let me take you on a journey from the Middle Age to the 1960s. Picture this, a dark, stormy night in an old castle, or maybe a foggy afternoon in a lush green forest. Or imagine a bright, sun-dappled field filled with people playing instruments. Any of these settings could be the backdrop for one of the many revival movements over the years, each trying to breathe life back into a long, dead, sometimes forgotten or even ridiculed aesthetic of the Middle Ages. Often romanticized, the Middle Age sets the scene for many dreaming of an idyllic escape. In a way, the medieval revival was a kind of escapism. People have always used history, whether fantastical or mundane, as a way to retreat from the present. Everything we create draws from somewhere. However, for many, the Middle Age holds a special kind of magic. From the Victorian Romantic era, when the pre-Raphaelites gave the Middle Age a magical, mythical glow, to the swinging 60s with its psychedelic folk troubadours, bringing back medieval elements into style. The fascination with medieval fashion just keeps coming back. I just want to add a quick disclaimer. When I talk about the Middle Ages here, I am mostly referring to Britain and a bit of France, since those are the two places that inspired the medieval revival the greatest, as well as the two countries where it was most popular. As said in a couple of previous videos, by the late 60s, many were over the clean cut mod looks. What came next, in many ways, was very contrary to the looks of the mid 1960s swinging London. Many were looking for an escape during a time where the Vietnam War and social tensions influenced the lives of many. To find an escape, many turned to the past. But why the Middle Age? For one thing, the Middle Age is a time that spent over a thousand years, so there's a lot to pull from. Even people who scoff the Middle Age as dark or backwards, like the Victorians, still longed for it. Since the Renaissance, classicism has never really fallen out of favor. English Palladianism and the neoclassical movement of the 18th century only reinforced this, elevating anything that looked Roman or Greek to the highest status. The most passionate Gothic enthusiasts were hoping for a kind of anti-Renaissance moment, where modern Europe would realize that the Middle Ages weren't the Dark Ages at all, but rather a Golden Age. Romanticizing a time marked by vast inequality, disease, war and famine begs the question, why are these eras so idolized? Reflecting on revivals and their interpretation of history brings forth the need to confront the inherently problematic aspects of this process. History and memory are not fixed entities. History is constructed from memory, and human memory is not only fallible, but also limited. Much is forgotten, and what is remembered is shaped by a multitude of factors. Politics, health, worldview, education, age, gender, sexuality, the list goes on and on. As a result, the past is never something universally agreed upon, nor should it be. The past is and always will be open to interpretation and reinterpretation. What is recalled are fragments, flashes and images. The memory is non-linear, often fuzzy, and fashion mirrors this dynamic. When fashion revives an interpretation of the past, it pulls from those fragmented memories. Modern takes on medieval styles are not direct connections to the Middle Ages, rather they result from multiple layers of interpretation. What is to refer to as the medieval revival often bears a little resemblance to the actual medieval period. More often, it's a blend of Renaissance styles, heavily influenced by Victorian Romanticism and the Pre-Raphaelites, with only a hint of authentic medieval details. Just as an example, think about the white sleeves of the Hopaland, buttons on a kirtle, metal jewelry and belts. The rest is more like a game of historical telephone. Different centuries, countries, social statuses get mixed and while the looks have a medieval look to them, they're mostly not authentic. Especially in the late 60s, the medieval revival saw a lot of short skirts and psychedelic colors, prints and bold patterns, all of which wasn't worn in the Middle Age, but works really well with the overall silhouettes. 
The first medieval revival came with the Victorians. However, the Victorians didn't care much for historical accuracy. They had their own spin on whatever era caught their fancy. Take this excerpt from Thomas Wharton's History of English Poetry from 1824. We look back on the savage condition of our ancestors with the triumph of superiority. We are pleased to mark the steps in which we have been raised from rudeness to elegance. This really greatly explains the Victorian mindset of romanticizing the Middle Age while also looking down on it. Some argue medievalism was born out of Victorian modernization. The Industrial Revolution swept away the pastoral past, replacing it with a mechanical future that was both thrilling and unsettling. People turned to the past to ground themselves, to figure out how to fit into the present and the future. For many Victorians, the fantasy of the Middle Age became a source of inspiration, fantasy and escapism. It also played into the generational rebellion I talked about in a couple of videos before. Each new generation wants to be different from the one before, often wanting to break free from the conventional norms and express their true selves. Just like how mod fashion in the 60s pushed against the norms of the 50s, women wearing bolder, brighter, and more rebellious styles to break free from societal constraint, it wasn't just about the clothes, it was about challenging gender norms, carving out space for their voices, and claiming a little bit of freedom. In both cases, it's the same story. Fashion, whether medieval-inspired or mod, reflects shifting cultural and political tides. 19th century medievalism was characterized by two main ideas. Romanticized naturalism, which linked simple emotions and heroism to nature and the past, and a nostalgia for feudalism viewed as a stable, idealized social structure. These ideas and looks inspired the Victorian medieval revival, and decades later would even inspire the psychedelic movement. Armour became a key element of this nostalgia, and King Arthur emerged as the perfect Victorian hero, blending imperialism, Christian virtue, and gentlemanly ideals. Pre-Raphaelite artists like John William Waterhouse, John Everett Millais, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, one of my personal favorites, Elizabeth Siddle, and Evelyn de Morgan were crucial in shaping this fantasy version of the medieval world. Their paintings cemented the idea of the Middle Ages as a dreamy, fairy tale realm, an aesthetic that persists today in fairy tale illustration. Beyond painting, William Morris, with his focus on medieval floral patterns and tapestries, laid the groundwork for the arts and craft movement. His designs didn't just inspire textiles, they influenced how interior designs evolved during that period. His designs were favored by many 60s and 70s designers, like Biba founder Barbara Hulaniki. The Victorian fascination with medieval aesthetics was largely superficial though. Most saw the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages, a time of backwardness compared to their own superior society. Despite this, they couldn't resist borrowing from the visuals and pageantry of the period. By the 1840s, dresses started to reflect medieval elements. Sloped shoulders, elongated waists, and narrow sleeves mimicked the look of Gothic architecture. Fashion took cues from this idealized medieval world, especially through costume parties and the rise of printed medieval imagery. Women began to experiment with medieval-inspired styles like scalloped edges, front buttoned gowns, and capes, adding to the visual fantasy that medievalism represented. By the 1910s, medieval influences became even more prominent, with high collars and other details creeping into fashion. But it was the 1960s and 70s when the medieval revival truly exploded. So welcome to the wonderful world of the 60s and 70s medieval revival. I know it took a little bit to get to this point in the video. I hope you're still here. I just wanted to give you all this background information because I believe it is truly important to know this, to understand the rest of the video going from here. The 60s and 70s gave us futuristic space age, mod looks, boho and hippie styles, but also brought back Art Nouveau, Victorian and Prairie styles. The 1970s especially loved medieval inspired patterns, mock neck dresses and peasant blouses that screamed nostalgia from the past. The 1960s medieval revival brought back a blend of historical inspiration and free-spirited creativity, reshaping medieval aesthetics to fit the countercultural movements of the time. This revival wasn't about strict historical accuracy, but rather about capturing the romance and fantasy of the Middle Ages through modern lenses. So let's talk about the key elements of 1960s and 70s medieval revival fashion. 
dresses and tunics took on medieval shapes, with flowing, loose-fitting garments that resembled the gowns of the past. Bell sleeves, empire waists, and long draped skirts were popular. These shapes were often combined with bohemian touches like embroidery or patchwork, creating a dreamy, ethereal look. In the late 1960s, and especially in designs by Dutch art collective The Fool, many short dresses and playful silhouettes were seen, combining the medieval revival with another big trend of the time, psychedelia. Folk-inspired peasant blouses and dresses were everywhere, tapping into both medieval and renaissance fashion. They typically featured billowing sleeves, lace, and floral embroidery, drawing from the romanticized image of medieval peasants. Rich fabrics like velvet, brocade, and suede were staples in medieval revival fashion. Velvet capes and dresses added a touch of regal drama, while intricate brocade patterns evoked the elegance of the past. Designers like Thea Porter helped bring these luxurious materials to life and into Britain's fashion boutiques. The high medieval style neckline came back in full force. Mock turtlenecks and high neck tunics were a staple, nodding to medieval fashion but with a sleek modern twist. Square necklines were popular too, often adorned with velvet or glittering lace details. Waist cinching belts with elaborate metal buckles were a signature accessory, often paired with flowing gowns or tunics. These belts added a bit of medieval armor-like structure to otherwise soft silhouettes. Intricate embroidery and tapestry-like patterns were often seen in clothing and accessories. This tied directly into the medieval aesthetic, echoing the look of traditional tapestries and knightly attire, but with a 60s psychedelic twist. This is kind of what is going on with this dress that I'm wearing. It has this really beautiful strip down the front that is really reminiscent of these kind of tapestries. Capes became statement pieces in the medieval revival, adding a dramatic, fairy tale feel to the outfits. These were often made from velvet or heavy wool with elaborate embroidery or beading. Headdresses and circlets reminiscent of medieval queens and maidens were popular in both everyday wear and for festivals. Floral crowns, braided hair and ribbons added to the romanticized medieval look often inspired by pre-Raphaelite paintings. Lace of boots and sandals reflected the earthy, grounded feel of the medieval revival. Suede boot, particularly knee-high or ankle boots, gave a nod to medieval fashion, while still being perfect for the era's folk and bohemian style. Jewel tones like emerald green, deep purples, and rich blues were favored, as were earthy tones like burned orange and mustard. Psychedelic patterns sometimes made their way into the designs, blending medieval inspiration with the free-spirited energy of the 1960s. Overall, the 1960s medieval revival combined fantasy with fashion, channeling the free-spirited rebellion of the era into styles that felt ancient yet vibrant. It was the perfect match for the counterculture's rejection of the mainstream and its embrace of a romantic and mystical past. Music, particularly in the folk and psychedelic scene, took fashion into even wilder territory. Folk music stirred up interest in nature, ancient myths, and mystical themes tapping into medieval romance and fairy tales. Donovan was a master at this. His music and image embodied Arthurian legends and medieval dreaminess. Songs like The Song of the Wandering Angus and The Sellers of Stars carried that mystical medieval sound. Other folk bands like The Incredible String Band and Sun Forest were also deep into the magical, mystical vibe. And The Fool, the Dutch art collective that used to work with the Beatles a lot, took it even further with their medieval-inspired psychedelic art, designing costumes, album covers, stage sets, and even a whole store for the Beatles. Their work perfectly captures the 1960s fantasy take on the Middle Ages, vibrant, whimsical, and utterly drenched in escapism. The year 1968 brought the medieval revival into the movie theaters. Films like Romeo and Juliet and Wonderwall played a significant role in both shaping and being shaped by the medieval revival, particularly through the lens of the 1960s and 70s countercultural trends. These films acted as conduits for reimagining medieval themes in a way that resonated with the ideals of the time. Romanticism, escapism, and a yearning for a return to nature and simplicity, while also incorporating contemporary concerns like rebellion and the rejection of modernity. Franco Zeffirilli's Romeo and Juliet was steeped in Renaissance and medieval-inspired aesthetics. Its visual design featured lavish costumes, elaborate sets, and idealized romantic vision of a bygone era. 
The film, while set in Renaissance Verona, had a dreamlike quality, echoing the nostalgia for medieval themes popular in the 1960s. This imagery contributed to the romanticized view of the past, which aligned with the emerging hippie and bohemian movements. These movements were drawn to medieval and Renaissance aesthetics as symbols of authenticity, spiritual depth, and a rejection of the industrialization and materialism. The film's lush visuals, with their emphasis on earthy textures, flowing gowns, and courtly love, help reinforce the notion that the medieval period was a time of purity, passion, and connection to nature. All central tenets of the counterculture's values. Wonderwall, a psychedelic cult film, takes a different approach, but taps into the same medieval revival through its surrealistic and fantasy-inspired visuals. The film, directed by Joe Massett, tells the story of an eccentric scientist who becomes obsessed with his beautiful neighbor, whose life he spies on through a hole in the wall. The visuals and pictures out of this film are very popular. Jane Birkin played their lead, and it is a truly magical film. While not overtly in a medieval setting, the film's aesthetic reflects the late 1960s fascination with escapism, fantasy, and alternate realities, ideas deeply intertwined with the medieval revival. The vibrant, dreamlike visuals set in a scene designed by the fool, combined with George Harrison's ethereal soundtrack, evoked a sense of otherworldliness that mirrored the counterculture's desire to escape from the constraints of modern life. Both films were part of a broader cultural movement in the late 1960s that romanticized the past, particularly the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, as an antidote to the alienation of modern industrial society. The medieval revival during this period was fueled of Victorian medievalism and the countercultural movements that sought to reject mainstream consumerism and war, particularly the Vietnam War. The fascination with the medieval era, with its perceived values of spirituality, nature and communal living, aligned with the ethos of the hippie movement. Films like Romeo and Juliet and Wonderwall visually represented this yearning for a simpler, more authentic existence, away from the pressures of the modern world. At the same time, these films helped shape the medieval revival by providing cultural touchstones that reinforced this aesthetic. Romeo and Juliet's romanticized portrayal of young love in an opulent, historically inspired setting directly influenced fashion trends of the time, such as flowing Renaissance-style dresses and medieval-inspired accessories. While Wonderwall contributed to the psychedelic reinterpretation of the past, blending medieval elements with the dreamlike fantastical. In essence, both films were deeply intertwined with the medieval revival, reflecting and amplifying the 1960s fascination with the past. They helped embed the medieval revival and Renaissance aesthetics into the cultural consciousness, reinforcing the period's imagery of escapism, romance, and a return to a natural, idealized way of living. But the 60s and 70s medieval revival wasn't by far the last. Every now and then someone wanders upon the dreamy look of the past, mixing its origins with all of its revivals, reimagining the medieval revival once again. By keeping these medieval revivals alive, we're keeping alive the hopes and dreams of generations that came before us. We acknowledge their beauty, we reinvent it in our own way, and in doing so we give it a new life. This is not just escapism, it's an opportunity for us to continue the human story, to honor the past while creating something fresh, new, and undeniably beautiful. So that is it for today's video. I truly hope you enjoyed. I know I've never taken it this far back in history, but as I said, I felt like this was really important to understand the medieval revival of the 1960s. I would also like to apologize for possibly saying any of the art terms wrong um, I took art and history in school. It is something I'm personally really interested in, but all these names are so different in all the languages and I'm just trying my best. As always, I have a Pinterest board linked down below with all the pictures I used for this video. So whether there's something that tweaked your interest or you just want to take another general look, make sure to click on the link. I would love to know what you think about the 1960s and 70s medieval revival. I feel like it's a very niche trend, something that definitely wasn't worn by a lot of people. It was a very editorial trend too, 
but I personally feel like it has a place in the late 1960s and 70s and it is a type of fashion that I personally truly adore so I really wanted to make this video. If you enjoyed this video and you would like to see more about the 60s and the 70s, make sure to subscribe. I upload new videos every week and I would love to have you around. I would love you to give it a thumbs up and maybe even share it with a friend. It supports me, it supports the channel and it would truly mean the world. I hope you have a beautiful day, go out, enjoy the sunshine, take yourself some time to focus on you and your mental health today, maybe look at some medieval drawings, and I will see you in the next video. Bye dolls!